I, I believe we go director of programming with connect.faith leading a lot of our, our digital ministries there. Welcome, David. I am David Gambrell, Associate for Worship in the PCUSA Office of Theology and Worship here in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where I've served for 14 years and um, worked on things like the, the latest edition of the Book of Common Worship, the, the Glory to God hymnal. Um, and, um, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about the big picture and big projects, um, trying to serve as many people as possible in the church while always remembering, um, and this is a tricky balance, that real worship happens in a thousand particular ways in local congregations. Um, and so in order to um, remember yeah, that, yeah. Um, I'm also an active worshiper and Sunday school teacher and choir member at Highland Presbyterian Church here in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, um, where we've been meeting online for a year um, with Facebook and YouTube, but we're just beginning to take st some small steps back to worship in the sanctuary. Great. Veronica, you're up next. I am Reverend Veronica Cannon, and I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I serve First Presbyterian Church in Waxhaw. It is a small church, and I started with them last June, and up until that point, they had not begun worshiping. To, they had not worshiped together as a community. We began worshiping via um, Facebook Live, and now we're also doing Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, the impact of our worshiping community has been that it has gone beyond the, the, the uh, numbers of people in the church to a wider community um, that we are reaching, and, um, and we're reaching people uh, not only in North Carolina, but uh, California and Georgia, as far as West California and Georgia, and even Texas in some ways. And so um, our ministry has really expanded. Wow. Thank you. John Cleghorn, that's across the city from you, I guess. <laughs> yes. Hi. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are. My name is John Cleghorn. I'm a pastor at Caldwell Presbyterian Church, also in Charlotte. And uh, we are. Uh, a community of faith of about 350 folks and uh, diverse and missional and justice oriented and uh, but like every other congregation uh, feeling our way through this pandemic and trying to understand uh, what hybrid life will look like. It's good to be with you all. Welcome. Rebecca. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Davis. I am a professor of Christian education at Union Presbyterian Seminary. I serve primarily on the on the Charlotte campus. Uh, and before coming to full time uh, academic teaching, I was a pastor and an educator. I'm a certified educator as well uh, for 25 years. So I come to um, teaching leaders for this new church with one foot in the parish and one foot in the academy. And we went totally virtual um, a year ago in March. And so this whole year has been uh, figuring out how to build community and how to teach uh, and empower leadership in this very changed and new world and church. Welcome, Mark. Hi friends, I'm Mark Kemp. I'm the music director at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, it's a congregation of about 2000. Uh, traditional music program with choirs all the way from uh, three years old up to however long you can stand up and make noises. Um, I also serve as the president elect of the Presbyterian Association of Musicians, which comes with a lot of responsibilities that I'm learning as we go. Uh, but our primary focus is to talk about collaborative experiences with God and with others uh, and what that brings to the church and our ministries and our work in the kingdom. Thank you. I'm rounding out this brain trust is Jerry Cannon. Jerry, introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. Oh, afternoon, whatever time it is. Thank you for having me on. Um, I'm Jerry Cannon. Uh, pastor here at C.N. Jenkins in Charlotte. Um, been here for um, almost 29 years in June. Um, and I say that only not as bragging rights, but to explain my context. So my first long session meeting uh, was in 1993, 94, 
or we met from about three hours to the side should we uh, get a dedicated line for fax as opposed <laughs> to telephone. Uh, the second long session meeting was in 1999. We were building a building and the argument, it wasn't, wasn't a, it was an argument. Do we get a tape duplicator or a CD burner? And last April, we went two hours uh, trying to decide, do we go from an analog board to a digital board? So when you're in a church for a long time, trust me, it's like, what are we talking about? But uh, yeah, that's what the pandemic has brought us. Everybody over 60 who said they were not going to do electronics are the biggest ones to sign on now. So um, I could be an advertiser, ARP, working at, at Best Buy. All the old people come see me. Um, I can get you online. So um, yeah, glad to be a part of the conversation. Thanks for the invitation. Jerry, when I go see my parents next weekend, I'm going to Zoom with you and get you to teach my mom how to do it. <laughs> Glad her church worships on television. So let's talk about meeting people where they are. That's what we really have had to engage in a new way this, um, this past year. So what does it mean to you to meet people where they are in this moment in American culture? Debbie, I know you have some thoughts on that. Sure. Um... So at Connect at Faith, we started it because we were aware that we, there were people that we weren't able to meet in uh, Ple at Pleasantville Presbyterian Church in a traditional worship environment for a variety of reasons back then. Things like they worked on Sunday morning or they didn't live in the area anymore. And as we went along, we found more reasons and more issues about um, things like I went to a church my church left the denomination and now I don't know where to go or who to trust or I've been hurt by a church but I felt like I saw something within your community that maybe is something I could be part of or again I work on Sundays and I just have no way to be feel like I'm part of a community because I can't worship together so some of the meeting people where they are was listening to their issues or concerns with church some of it was physical location and some of it was about theology. People would say things like, I can't find a church that fits what I believe about Jesus in my area. And I'm looking for that. I want a community that helps me with that. So on a lot of different levels, we felt like meeting people where they are was a definition of what we were trying to do. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Veronica, what, what about in your congregation and your community. What's that meant for you this year? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What is what has it meant for you this year to meet people where they are in your community? Yes, well, um, as I said, I started with them last June. Pandemic had already started and mm. they had not worshiped together as a community since the pandemic started. And I knew that it was important for them to get together, even if it was just an opportunity for them to feel like they were in some type of worship space together. Meeting the where they, where they are, um, many of them, because this is an older congregation and many of them uh, might have a cell phone, but it might not be like the cell phone, it might not be an iPhone or uh, something like that. They still, some of them still have <laughs> flip phones. Um, and if they have a newer phone, um, they don't know how to use it to get on technology. And so some of the challenge for me was trying to find a way to meet them where they were so that we could worship together. Um, some of them um, did, were able to get computers and get online. Some of them still did not. And so they would call in. Some of them, um, uh, still have not worshiped with us because they still don't have technology um, and have access to technology. So uh, we try to keep them informed by way of newsletter or, you know, I, we do something called call them all where we send out weekly messages to the congregation. So we try to meet them where they are and try to bring them on board um, as they are ready. Um, 
that's been important to the congregation. And we just this past Sunday had an opportunity. We didn't worship together, but we did have a, a what I called a Sunday fun day where they were able to come out and um, set eyes on one another and talk with one another after a, a year of drought. And that was very helpful for all of them. So we've just been trying to meet them where they are, bring them on board as they can and um, encourage them to to join with us. Um, some of them will even go to other family members' homes to worship with us. And so we've been trying to, to do that, meet them where they are in that way. I love, call them all. <laughs> that's, yeah. um, that's great. David, you have put together a resource that um, helps people think through some of the questions of how to do, what to do, with whom. You wanna talk about that? Absolutely. Um, so we've been thinking a lot about this question, uh, wrestling with how to meet people where they are. And, and it, um, it sometimes, uh, I would say, ought to involve some reflection on where we are, who we are, uh, our identity and mission as the church. And so the Office of Theology and Worship, together with uh, colleagues in uh, 1001, Nikki's office and Christian Formation, have put together um, a compass points uh, resource. It's a new resource from the national offices, and at some point we'll tell you how to, how to find that. Um, and it's, uh, it's questions, things to think about as you discern next steps in um, meeting people where they are. Thinking about people, you know, who are the people that have uh, joined us in this time? Who are the people that we're missing? Um, thinking about programs, what are the things that we are really doing faithfully and well, what are the things that have been a struggle, um, priorities in, in mission, whether that's compassion, peacemaking and justice, evangelism and so on, and then our capacity to um, keep, there, there's that document in the chat, thank you Nikki, um, our capacity to keep doing what we're doing, um, the, the need to let some things go. And then we lay out some possible um, steps forward from, from there. So I um, commend that resource to you. Um, I think when you, when you think about uh, meeting people where they are and, and being the church where we are, um, there are a variety of options open to you. So we're just trying to help people think imaginatively about that. That's a great thinking guide and decision-making guide, David. So yes, that PDF I did put directly in the chat. But it also, if you look up to the very top comment in the chat, there's a link to um, a Wakelet um, curation of resources that will get mentioned probably during the course of today's conversation, some other things. Um, this document is there as well as some other things that we'll talk about. So feel free to, um, to check that out. So, John, tell us a little bit about what you and your community have learned and experienced this past year that is informing how you're thinking about moving forward. Uh, so much uh, we have learned and so much we, we are still learning. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, a staff that has really embraced uh, kind of a mindset of abundance and not scarcity, uh, a... Uh, comfort with risk-taking, um, a, a comfort to try new things. Even if uh, we fail, we, we fail forward. Also a congregation that's extraordinarily gracious when we do fail. Um, I think we've learned an enormous amount about the importance and the centrality of community and relationship. Uh, you know, you miss what you don't have. Um, and we have had that. We've been able to sustain that. But boy, do we miss it in person, we've learned about the priority of pastoral care and contact and to, you know, call every, every name in the book if we can. Um, and uh, we've learned about uh, how it takes a village to do so much. Um, uh, a lot about flexibility and adaptability um, to uh, week to week. Um, and I think when we, uh, when we first got into this, and lo and behold, when we do get back together, hopefully fairly soon, we will have such a deeper appreciation for uh, our time together on Sunday morning. It has been you know, deeply and sorely missed. And if, if we were at risk of taking anything for granted about our community of faith and about 
spending time with our siblings in Christ. Um, we won't take that for granted ever again. Um, so that's just a, a, a beginning list, uh, but I'm sure there's a lot more wisdom on the panel. Yeah, I think Mark's got some things to share here and then I know Jerry does too. So Mark, you wanna go and then we'll Absolutely. let Jerry follow you. Uh, I think it's a, a, one of the most valuable things that we've come away with um, as, a, as a staff and as people who lead worship and, and uh, guide through worship is the, is the fact that we've all been removed and we've all been uh, um, privileged to have the perspective of being removed. So much of our focus before was uh, what are we doing in this space? But now we've all been allowed to experience it uh, in a way that so many people, that's their reality every week. Um, and Debbie, as you say, this is what you all, uh, this is your bread and butter, but um, the Presbyterian musicians, uh, and we lovingly call ourselves Pam, um, Pam has a, a subgroup that is a first call pastor community, um, and, and there's a document that, that a group from that community put together that helps us realize, even as we go back in, uh, even as we're able to gather together physically, again, there are going to be people who are removed from that, um, no matter what the circumstances are. That's not a reality for them at all. So our broadened perspective is what we've gained. Um, that we really need to not only make uh, little accommodations along the way, you know, we, um, 10 years ago, this, the congregation here at Westminster thought we were really doing great by live streaming uh, our service. And it was at that time, but it was the equivalent of, you know, a, a dad at a soccer game with the big VHS camera on his shoulder. Um, it really didn't do a whole lot to accommodate participating in the community and being part of the community. It was really, here's a bird's eye view so you can see what's going on. Well, now we have such a greater appreciation for how do we engage across so many different platforms? How do we engage with the people that are physically uh, in the sanctuary, but also those who are worshiping through a computer screen and not dividing those, not becoming two separate communities. So this first call pastor task group, um, which brought some great wisdom to, to what are the things we need to consider um, in that moving forward, not moving towards a goal of getting back in the same space, but moving forward to see how God is still gathering folks together uh, as a community, even though it's not in our traditional way. Um, and also in that resource list, there's a, a full um, discussion webinar uh, that Presbyterian musicians hosted in the town hall um, with, with uh, Kendra Buck, Walter Smith from Pittsburgh Seminary and Allie Utley from University of the Redlands that, um, that discusses these things further in depth. So I hope that you can see uh, that resource and that document, that PDF. But that, gaining that perspective has been so valuable in music and liturgy and as those come together in worship um, for all of us, I think. I appreciate that perspective. Jerry. Yes. Um, let me pick on what John said, that whole idea of pastoral care has been uh, like superimposed on a great need uh, in the last 12 months or so. And uh, what we found a way to stay connected, um, <clears throat> we do a, a daily morning prayer call. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean daily, every day, Monday through Saturday, Monday through Friday at seven o'clock, which, you know, yeah, it means four or five sermons that you got to produce, but uh, it's tremendous because that's the only live voice that a lot of our seniors were hearing all day long. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were listening to CNN and Fox and everybody, but you actually heard your pastor. So it was, uh, and thank you, John, for being a very pastoral. Um, to pick up on, on what Mark said about, um, you know, streaming, we weren't streaming before the pandemic. But uh, what we did, it was like the, the VCR camera. Um, but what we found, uh, and I picked this up, we started last, I guess, April, streaming and, and YouTubing. Joe Clifford told me, he said, Jerry, here's your motto. You got to understand, you're now going to record live in front of a TV audience, meaning that going forward, it's like the old Johnny Carson show. There were only about 75 people in the audience but you were trying to get to 75 million. So mm -hmm. that's been our approach toward uh, recording. We record tonight, uh, which is, I'm sorry, Nikki, you give me the microphone, that's gotta go. So sidebar, <laughs> I could not believe Easter morning, 
at 9.30, I'm driving around trying to find some coffee. You know, I've been in the game 34 years. I never tried to get coffee at 9.30 on Easter morning, <laughs> but we recorded on Wednesday. So like, what else to do, right? <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. But anyway, uh, come back and I'll share some other things um, that hopefully be helpful. And and I want to put in the chat box that, that prayer call number. Now, I'm going to warn you, it's like Saturday Night Live because people will... You hear them snoring on the call. You hear them coughing, watching TV, flushing the commode. I mean, it's crazy, but it's it's like a hundred folk every morning. Every morning they're there. So uh, I'm gonna put the number in so y'all can uh, just join us. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Please do. That is a great segue, though, Jerry, um, to technologies and the ways that we can use technologies to create community. That's about as old a school technology as probably most of us are using. But Rebecca, why don't you share with us a little bit about your experience creating community through digital technologies? So on the Charlotte campus, um, we have a very strong cohort model. Um, and part of what because our students tend to go part-time from Charlotte um, because they're working full-time. How do you create that cohort? How do you uh, create that sense of strength and connectedness uh, even when this, this year they've never met? Um, and what I realized was one, it takes a little longer than it takes the in-person cohort to connect, but it happens um, and finding we tend to think of um, technology as utilitarian. And so it's let's get on, let's get what we need to do done, and then let's get off. Um, and what we've discovered is opening the uh, Zoom space early and staying after so folks can come in and bring their lunch or talk with one another or talk with the professor, giving space for um, laughter uh, and prayer together. That has helped. Um, I have come to, which every person who knows me well will laugh hilariously, that I have become the um, educational technology person. Um, and so uh, there's a, a technology piece called Flipgrid, um, which is incredibly easy to use and it's free. Um, and all the technologies that I'll mention um, are on this wakelet. And it allows folks to uh, record a one and a half minute, a three minute introduction. And so long before the class begins, they are recording on our uh, Blackboard site physically what their face looks like and who they are and what they love. And instead of having them write uh, reviews of the books that they're reading, they're talking it through instead of analyzing worship service, they're recording on Flipgrid. And so everybody else who's gathered gets a sense of the personality uh, and, and the uh, perspective that they're bringing. And so, um, you know, there are asynchronous ways and there are synchronous ways, but what we have found are um, three or four really easy, good, solid uh, educational technologies that, that promote and create the space. The technology doesn't create the community. It enables, it empowers uh, the community to be built through that. So well said. Brian, you came into the pandemic as already the tech expert for connect.bay. So tell us a little bit about what you know about how technology has worked in your community um, to help you all build relationships in maybe similar to the cohorts and the Charlotte campus people who had never met in person because you started as a digital community. Yeah, thank you. I love what Rebecca said that the technology doesn't technology doesn't create the community. And we've thought about that at connect.faith and we've had to think about that with Pleasantville as Pleasantville Presbyterian Church has stepped into this pandemic model. These technologies can't be the ministry. The ministry, we have to figure out what the ministry needs to be in this time so that we can meet people where they are. And then we have to figure out how to get the technology to, to facilitate that. And it's, it's been a challenge for us and it's been a lot of fun rethinking. 
okay, so we're used to worship being something that happens live. And if you're 10 minutes late, which 90% of the congregation always was, you miss the announcements. And as we went into this pandemic time, technology allows us to make some accommodations there. And so it's given us an opportunity to think about what parts of the ministry are, uh, to use Rebecca's word, asynchronous versus synchronous. What What is, you have to be there at a given time and what can be shared after the fact on demand and what is one-on-one -on -one, um, and what can be done in a group. And it, it allowed us to think about all of the different types of ministry that we're doing. And, and with connect.faith, all the different types of ministry we want to be doing and then find the right technologies to to really empower that and it's you know the technologies are, are what we're all hearing um you know we use a lot of zoom and social media and, and youtube um but it, it's really for me the power has been in sitting down and trying to evaluate what is the ministry what is our what is our goal who are we trying to reach and then trying to leverage the technology to uh, to drive to that such good words and you both remind me that this time last year I was just learning the word synchronous and asynchronous <laughs> when it comes to learning models. Um, when, when this panel got together last week to kind of talk through their experiences, we realized that grief and trauma over the past year were going to shape for sure at, at least our initial regatherings in person and um, the processing of loss, um, loss of members to COVID or just death of members um, who, who will be greatly missed in the congregation. And I know Rebecca, you and John both had some helpful things to say about um, grief and trauma and the impact of those things as you make your decisions about regathering. Will you all share some of those thoughts? Go ahead, John. I was going to defer to the teacher, but I'll, uh, I won't waste our time kicking the ball back and forth. <laughs> yes, um, you know, I, I think uh, certainly a lot of us have talked with colleagues that uh, there have been losses due to COVID. Um, as a somewhat younger congregation, that wasn't as much an issue with, with us. I mean, I, not, not that it was an, strictly an age thing, but we had one loss to COVID of a, of a senior member. But um, much more traumatically, we had... Uh, unexpected four losses of members to, to various things, one murder, two uh, sudden illnesses um, that were unexpected. Um, and uh, these were pillars. These were giants in the church. And so we've been trying to think very carefully. My, uh, our, our staff, Gail Henderson Belsito, Ann Hunter Eidson, Justin Martin, and others, along with our session, uh, about what it will be like to return to space and not have those giants uh, who are always in the same place in the pews. And they were, you know, practically, you know, uh, pillars. Uh, if, if, if people can be pillars that hold up the roof of the church, either in their spirit or their singing or their witness or their loving personality, we know that uh, there will be trauma upon return. And so we're thinking very carefully about how do we re-enter that space and uh, probably do so, you know, open the, open the sanctuary before our first worship service and let people just come. And it might be an artistic uh, approach that says, here are their spirits, uh, because we're gonna look to four places in the pews and not see these folks. When our choir stands up, Two of our best voices are not going to be there um, and it's going to remind us what happened to them and so we've got a lot of work to do we're not experts about it but we're certainly thinking as uh, widely and as broadly as we can because uh, um, we know we'll be missing them and uh, and then there's so much other types of trauma when you uh, just to double back real quickly to that first question Nikki about meeting people where they are. I, th I think we all have experienced as well that uh, where people have been over the last year is also influenced by you know, deep, deep, deep political division and fear. Um, what's happened with race in America, which is not new, uh, but what has you know, reached epidemic proportions. And so there's been, you know, we've been through a lot apart 
and how do we come back together in a very healthy way that doesn't pretend that we didn't, that doesn't pretend these four individuals, these four giants are, are not there, although we celebrate their spirits and their, their presence, but also that we come back um, exhausted on, on, on many levels and, and yet hopefully on the other side of that exhaustion uh, is hope and uh, spirit to, to fight for justice. Rebecca. Rebecca. Thanks. Um, you know, we don't talk a lot of, about trauma in the church, uh, or at least we have it. Uh, if a church has had a fire or if it's had some a pastor die, um, we might talk about trauma, but, but what we've come to understand and, you know, we're, we are reformed people and we believe that God is the Lord of all creation and wisdom comes from places other than simply uh, in theology books. Um, and the CDC talks about trauma and trauma is not an event. It is the body's response to an event or a series of events that have been emotionally or physically life-threatening. And, and particularly if it is sustained and we have had 13 months of sustained triple pandemic of COVID, of race, and of extreme poverty. And so all of us, none of us will escape the fact that all of our people and we are experiencing trauma. And there is not one single way that we experience trauma. So my experience of trauma and how I process it is gonna be different than John's or Veronica's. Um, and so I think it's incredibly important for pastors and educators to remember that there are, uh, there's not a program. It's not a curriculum. It's not a packaged with a bow uh, thing that you can buy or that you can borrow, but rather it's kind of six essential principles. Um, and in, I, I, I was like, oh, do I take the time? You know, it's, it's about creating the space um, in which people can come back. And I think, thank you, Nikki, um, it's all kind of lined out there, or at least the abbreviated form of it is. Um, but it's remembering that when folks are upset with you when you come back, or the fact that it's not exactly like it was, I thought when we came back, we would be able to hug. Or when we came back, we would all be able to sing and have our great music, or we would all have this fight we are probably not coming back like that. And, and their response is really not about you. It's really coming out of a place of trauma. Um, and so I think that that's, um, I think that's part of what we need to look at. And I think looking at what the CDC, these six principles, if we can keep those in mind as we are crafting our strategies for returning, as we're thinking about uh, what it's going to look like. And um, the group heard me say the other day that, um, you know, we have to think about and, not the way it was, not the way I think it should be, not we're all going back and we're going to be there, you know, not what we're returning and we're going to leave Facebook or uh, uh, YouTube streaming, but it's and. We're going to be in person and hybrid. We're going to have Bible studies where we sit around a table with a cup of coffee, and we're going to have folks who Zoom in, who will be there every bit as much uh, in their fullness and their being as if they were sitting around the table. But crafting those ministries and thinking about those strategies really needs to be done from a perspective of we all have experienced and are experiencing trauma. Thank you so much. Mark, you had something to add here. I, I did. I think it's also important to recognize that we all as uh, worship leaders and church professionals have been through trauma as well um, and, and self-inflicted in a lot of ways where we have seen the pressures of, from a musician standpoint. Uh, I mentioned this the other day, all of the virtual choirs and the slick technologies that uh, to some communities comes very easily. Some communities embrace it. And um, if I had a dollar for every uh, person who asked me if my choir was doing virtual choirs over the course of the past year, uh, I could retire a happy man. Um, but there, we, we bring those, we too have been through traumas um, 
and and sometimes we have to let the community feed us as well uh either in my experience through their song and through their uh support and that's something that's very important to us and um i also i think that um the grief and the trauma has exposed as you said who we really are and what we really are and it's removed all of our own expectations and we can come back to what has God really called our communities together to be uh, and what is Christ doing among those communities and how should we really be focusing on that as we move forward as you say Becky and how should we focus on that as we move forward instead of carrying this this light switch expectation that we can flip it back to the way things were. Um, even though those were glorious, wonderful days for some people, um, that's not what God's calling us for in the future. And we don't need to carry that with us, certainly. Absolutely, thank you so much. So I would like to um, give you all, um, the folks who have joined us, 60, 70 so folks, um, an opportunity to ask some questions. I have not seen anything um, particularly posted in the chat. So um, if you would like to raise your hand or drop something in the chat, we'll try to make sure we catch it. Um, questions out there? Nikki, while we watch for questions, may I add to what Marcus just said? Absolutely. Um, I worry a lot. Uh, so I, I look at the names and, and the, the faces that are on this call and see lots of beloved colleagues and, and friends in ministry. And I, I know that you all are doing amazing things with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. And, and yet, as, as Mark has, has just said, um, we've been through the wilderness and this has been a, a traumatic year. There's, a, I think, gonna be a great temptation and we can already see this happening to, to deceive ourselves into thinking that we can just bounce back. That, uh, as Mark said, we can flip that switch and go back to normal. Um, but if that means doing everything that we've been doing in the pandemic and doing everything we were doing before the pandemic, that's a recipe for, for burnout. Um, some of you on this call, I know, know my friend uh, Wally Fletcher, who's a pastor and uh, psychotherapist in, in Philadelphia, and he talks about resilience not as bouncing back, but bouncing forward. Um, and I think this is a time for us to think about um, what are we going to carry forward and what are we going to leave behind? Who is God calling us to be now? How is God calling us to, to do some new things? I think I'd love to know um, how some of you who have joined this conversation today are bouncing forward. Um, or John, was it you that used the phrase successful failures? Um, <laughs> have we, what have we all experienced over the past 13 months that were successful failures or bouncing forward? Um, I saw a hand go up. Simon, do you wanna jump in? I have, a, I have a question. I have, I have no bouncing forwards to, to, that are worth sharing. Um, I wonder uh, about creating hospitality and building relationships for new folks visiting our, our congregations, um, not being able to, to see them uh, sitting in the pews or see them walking out uh, as, as they're being greeted. Any, any techniques to, to build relationships with, with people coming to check us out? Debbie, I wonder if you have some experience with that. <laughs> um, so a couple things that we have tried that have been helpful. One is we had a, a virtual coffee hour that you could come to after worship. And we did at times have people come that were unexpected or from different places. That takes a certain level of confidence though. We also had a chat in Facebook and on YouTube so that as people watched worship, they could say good morning and pass the peace to each other. And that again was a way that the people self-identified that they were interested in being at least a little bit known, which on the beginning level, I felt like those were helpful ways to connect beyond the boundaries. Then we've also used social media to find some ways to give people a chance to connect. We did things like 
book club or um, we did during Lent and during Advent, we did book studies. And one of the things I thought was really interesting is we always tell people to invite their friends to church, right? But it actually worked during this time. We had people invite their relatives and friends to come to the book club on Zoom and got to connect with people in really meaningful ways that we had never met before. So maybe making that intentional invitation to the people who might know them is another way to help break that boundary. Good work. Other thoughts? <laughs> how else did you do? How else did you do that? Rebecca Kirkpatrick has a question. Your hands up. You want to jump in, Rebecca? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think this could be, um, you know, very similar in what was just shared, could be seen as a bounce forward, that one of the things that, um, you know, being online, especially being online with adult education allowed us to do was for folks to invite not just other friends who might not have engaged locally, but folks from around the country, you know, maybe who um, were connecting. And so we are now beginning um, sort of an anxiety uh, <laughs> process or grieving process about what it will mean to not be able to maintain some of those relationships um, as we go back in person. And so trying to navigate, you know, should a class that really isn't technologically able to handle, they can do Zoom, they can do all Zoom and they can do all in person, but they really aren't capable of doing hybrid. You know, how do we help them sort of celebrate these sort of new connections, but to remember that maybe we as a church can't be a church, a national church, <laughs> right? That, that we need to be willing to say that we can't um, be available to everyone which sounds very ungracious, but yeah. <laughs> it's a real, real concern. Yeah. It's hard, but the capacity, I mean, that's one of the things we just have to keep thinking through is what, what can we do authentically and well. Mark, did you want to comment there? I did. The one thing that, um, the one thing that sort of uh, connecting all of these uh, forms of gathering, as, as we might call it, uh, seems to be our language. The language that we're using with people, um, whether it's uh, whether it's face to face, whether it's across a computer, whether it's written, and that communicates so much of what uh, what our intention is and how we treat that community. So, um, if if we're looking for a common thread, um, and and I think there's a question that Amy asked in the chat. If we're looking for a common thread that unites everybody, the one thing that we carry to each of those. Uh, different experiences is our language. And if we're intentional in that way, uh, that we don't divide and we don't separate and we don't call out those differences, then I think that that is, is our first step at acknowledging that we're one community instead of separate ways. The beginning, Jerry, your hand was up and then I'll get you, Callie. Jerry, what? Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to add, we found that um, <clears throat> there was some value in brokering some services with our, our county, Beckenberg County. They have these, uh, they have some COVID money for seniors. So um, we were able to actually pick up uh, free laptops. Now they're used, they're old and heavy, but they will come with uh, some preloaded software for Zoom and um, oh, uh, Google and other things like that. And we're able to give those out. Also, uh, the county had money to actually spray your home, you know, fumigate your house for COVID uh, if you're 60 and above. And we did that particular with veterans, but then we opened it up for others. Um, and what I'm saying is that, uh, and plus AT&T were doing hotspots as a part of keeping folk connected. And I share that because there may be some other county funds uh, wherever people are, are living, uh, just call your, your senior, um, your senior group, uh, that's, you can start there, but uh, those, those particular things in the name of the church, and we didn't want to take credit for it, but it was like, we're going to broker this, we're going to put it on a website, call up our seniors, put it out there for them, uh, and that was a, a big help uh, of helping stay connected. Genius. Cal, you have a question. Oh, I was going to say a bouncing forward. I, this is my first year in ministry, ordained ministry out of seminary. So I have joined the church via camera and in a big congregation. The thing that 
we had to fail at a few times, but was really meaningful was we're a congregation spread over Houston, which is enormous. And we developed um, a map and grouped people by groups of 10 to 12 households and kept like trying to start it and then having to stop and trying to start it and having to stop, but remaining open. And when we, when the time was right for outdoor gatherings of 10, we were ready and they have been so life-giving to uh, train to the 27 facilitators that are congregational volunteers. Um, and they're inviting people from their neighborhoods that they've been watching church with in the driveway. We have people call the church that are asking how they can check us out or whatever, and we can invite them to the one that's closest to where they live. Um, so anyway, it's been pretty amazing to see like what it is to stay flexible and imagine what's possible um, and get to meet some people in person. <laughs> I can't imagine beginning ministry in this context at all. I think one of our panelists was trying to get in. I'm not sure if it was Debbie or Veronica. It was Veronica. <laughs> Come on, Veronica. Well, I just wanted to, to touch on something that Rebecca mentioned about um, ha not having the capacity to be both hybrid, to be a hybrid community. Um, and how do you navigate that. Um, one of the things that um, we, my congregation was able to avail ourselves of some of those free computers that Jerry mentioned, and we were able to get those into the hands of some of our seniors who did not have technology so that they could join us for worship and other, and other ways of communicating. But one of the things that um, we've considered, and, and I've, I've even said to the congregation, when we return, we're going to have to try to find some way to remain with our online community. Um, because as I've said, we've got people that join us from California, Texas, and Georgia specifically, as well as people around North Carolina who um, come to, they're not always there on Sunday mornings, but they will check out the worship service at some point during the week. And we are seeing more people um, through the hybrid, through, not the hybrid, but through our online community than we were seeing on Sunday mornings because this is a small church. And because of some of the connections that we've made with people in Bible study who are not in North Carolina and this other class that I was doing where we make um, connections with people who are not in North Carolina, they feel like they're a part of uh, First Wax House Church family and they don't want to lose the connection. And so we are, we've, we've got to try to develop some kind of way where we can keep some of them connected with us um, when we do return to in-person worship. And that's um, conversation is beginning to be had concerning that, um, but we've got to find a way where we can continue to um, engage our online community as well as the people in the church in order to maintain those connections because people are finding value in that. Yes, absolutely. Agree. And we have we have capacity for that in a way that we didn't have before. What you know, I mean, to connect with people much more broadly, we. Um, we have about 10 minutes left in the hour. So questions, um, final pieces of wisdom from our panelists. Um, Jonathan Sherry just dropped one in the chat. This is, I'm trying to scan it really quickly. Um, do you wanna say this out loud, Jonathan, by any chance? So we're... Go ahead. <laughs> sure, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks, uh, Nikki, appreciate that. Um, we One of our pivots uh, this past year is um, in order to uh, compensate for the people who, that don't want to go on Zoom, that don't want to go online because they're sick of it by the end of the week. Um, we've, we've held um, drive-through in-person events uh, safely, um, as safely as we possibly can, and with masks, socially distanced. Uh, if we passed out food, we would uh, you know, do, uh, handle that safely. Uh, and we would um, have drive-through events with certain themes. This year, our theme has been uh, different aspects of prayer. So we do monthly drive-through events um, and we explore different uh, dimensions of prayer. So in March, um, uh, we put up a prayer wall uh, for, our, for our church community, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the community, uh, Holly Springs is where we're located, uh, 
Holly Springs, North Carolina. So we put it up for our, for our church community as well as the, the town of Holly Springs for anyone to, to uh, put up. Our, our, our church location is downtown Holly Springs, a little community. Uh, and so it just works perfectly. Uh, the drive-through events have been great because we've we've had people from the community to come out. We've had our own folk, uh, our 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 own church community, come out, and so it's just been a wonderful tool for evangelism, uh, for reaching out to the community as well as the sort of fellowship and pastoral care uh, moments. We even had a baby shower uh, recently uh, <laughs> at the drive-through event, uh, and and the family just absolutely loved it. It was a perfect day. Fortunately, it didn't rain. Uh, we did have some drive through events this year that have been in the cold and rain. Uh, and we just put on our warm boots and gloves and hats and, and welcome people as they drove through. It, it was really fantastic. And it was an alternative uh, to the digital uh, ministry that we've been, you know, uh, working on. Um, because there are some people that just, they, they crave that in person. Even, uh, we talk about early adopters uh, in, in our church. You know, there's some people that have gone out to the restaurants long before many others have. And so we've had some of our folks that just want to be in person in some form or another, and they're going to come out and they're going to wear their masks, and, but they're going to drive through and it's, and it's been good. It's communication all around. You're, John. I wanted to pick up on, on that good phrase uh, real quickly, early adopters, and it reminds me, um, uh, for some research I uh, needed to do, I was able to look uh, at churches that had almost to a one, uh, almost died, almost closed. And then that, that kind of brush with death really liberates uh, churches to try new things. And so um, I uh, learned so much from talking with these churches um, who had learned five, eight, 10 years ago that membership is more than just uh, what's on the books, that you can count Facebook people as members of your community, that you can uh, you know, take risks in worship and try new things and blend worship to uh, attract uh, a more diverse folks. And um, uh, I learned so much from them and they're five and 10 years into this and they've held on to these practices. So I think that that's a good word uh, for us to retain, uh, as, you know, I, I know we can't be all things to all people and, and burn our staves out. Um, but, but I think it is going to be interesting to see how we select what, what things we carry forward in, in hybrid life that, that redefine what it means to be a ministry. Um, that research is, um, in a, in a book that I'll drop into the chat. Please do, and that book is in the wakelet too. Um, Jerry, I wanted to give you the last word about, um, as John just hinted at it, what do you hear God calling C.M. Jenkins and Jerry Cannon to carry forward into the new year, the new way of being community? Um, what, can, what can you say to that? Yeah, thank you. I think presence, presence is the word. Uh, somebody used uh, pivot. Uh, that was also uh, what dropped into the lexicon uh, for 2020 and 2021. Um, prior to the pandemic, we had a mantra, and excuse me, Nikki, you know I'm Southern. We used the uh, example of Krispy Kreme. When the red light was on, you knew you got something hot and fresh. So we wanted to make sure all of our services were fresh, um, the sermons were fresh, the music was fresh and inviting. Um, since the pandemic and uh, Veronica and I, we went out to try to try to go out to eat when that first phase let us go eat. And uh, we had to wait in the parking lot for a table for 45 minutes. But we weren't the only people waiting in our car in the parking lot for a table. So people do want to come back. Um, it's one thing to call ahead uh, at Olive Garden um, but you cannot get those breadsticks and unlimited salad at a call in, which means that I believe church world, we've got people who really want to be in relationship. And I say to preachers all the time, don't worry about if you don't have a thousand views. OK, because these people who are looking at all these views, I mean, they're literally watching 
our numbers are all you need is two minutes and YouTube calls you a view, okay? Uh, but you're going to make a presence. You are a call pastor of word and sacrament. Um, yes, your members may have been watching preachers in California, but they're not coming to the hospital in Greenville, South Carolina. They're not going to make a home visit in Wilmington. They're not going to make, you know, those pop calls in Richmond. So you just be that pastor. You be that woman, that man of God that God's called you to be and just, just enjoy, have fun doing ministry. I mean, that's all I can just have fun. Love the people. Oh, Lord, love the people. Love them like love the, love the hell out of them. And then, you know, you just, just have a great time uh, just doing it. God's going to use you right where you are. Uh, and, uh, and just, I, I said, I mean, I can go on, but, uh, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm so glad you shared those last words with us. Um, everybody, thank you, panelists. Um, not enough time for all of you um, to share all that you know, um, but I'm grateful to you um, for sharing with us here. The wakelet's there. There's tons of stuff in the chat. I'm just going to leave this open for a few minutes in case anybody needs to grab any links from the chat, That because we had quite a few things added along. Um, Kirsty says that the recording of this will be up on the Scattered Church website Monday-ish, um, so that is pcusa.org slash scattered church. Um, so, and the wakelet will be there and anything else that we can manage to get there. There's, that page has been up for about a year and um, it has a lot of other resources on it. So blessings on all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, panel. Grateful to you. Peace be with you.